I want to talk about some of the work that I've been engaged in over the last, I would say, four or five years. So this is more recent. Uh, I'll tell you right now that you will find no mathematics in this talk, but I hope that you will go away with some new ideas. Ideas are a lot more important than mathematics. Uh, and the ideas that I want to explore surround the general issue of what I call extreme events, or more compactly, X events. And the story first starts with some uh, observations I made some years ago when I started getting into the, under the influence, so to speak, of some people in the U.S. and in Austria who are, go under the label futurists, futurists. And maybe some of you have heard one of my friends in Vienna, he's pretty well known in Germany, his name is Matthias Horx. Uh, who has a research institute in Frankfurt, but he lives in Vienna and is a uh, futurist. And in conversations with Matthias and others, I came to realize that when you see reports from organizations about strategic planning or uh, reports in the media about what's going to happen next or how life is going to be like uh, in the future, almost always these reports have the following character. <clears throat> they say, well, if suppose you're talking about gen uh, gross domestic product or population or any phenomena of that kind, they say, well, here is the trend right now. Here's how it looks. And so suppose we just move this trend forward for the next one year, five years, 20 years, just project it out, for, and that's what the world's going to be like. Now, <clears throat> I think almost all of you here realize that this is a pretty uh, uh, shaky proposition to just do this, follow the current trend, and that's what the world will be like, uh, because in the mind of a trend follower, Surprises never happen. There are no surprises. Just the trend just continues. And in fact, this gives rise to something that occurred to me uh, a few years ago. What I, I now call it the black swan paradox, uh, in honor of my friend Nassim Talib, who wrote a book a few years ago called The Black Swan, which was a big bestseller. And the paradox is very simple. On the one hand, when you talk to people, Everyone agrees, surprises always happen. Surprises always happen. On the other hand, if you put on the table any specific surprise, a financial market crash or a crash of somebody's personal relationship or whatever, they say, oh, impossible. So unlikely, it's not worthy of consideration. Forget it, it's never gonna happen. So here you see the paradox. Surprises always happen, but no specific surprise ever happens. So how do you resolve this paradox, and why does it, why does it occur to begin with? Well, the main reason that it occurs, I'm going to show you a picture of this in a moment, is that trend following is very seductive. It's easy to do, and you're almost always right, except when you're not. And when you're not is exactly the point where you have a surprise. So that's the, the underlying story of this presentation is how do you identify when you're getting into danger zone? How do you identify when you're getting close to one of these points where the current trend is not going to continue, but is in fact is going to roll over? Okay. So, let's have a look at a few so here, I guess. Hmm. Okay, no matter. There we go. So here are some historical trends, just to give you an idea of what kind of trends are around. You see at the top the dinosaurs. They had a pretty good trend. They, they had a good run, 150 mil well, 135 million years, but eventually the dinosaur trend ended. The Romans, a lot shorter, but still a lot longer than a normal human lifetime or two. 
uh, down to uh, financial trends measured in decades at most, and trends in popular culture. So anyway, here you see trends come in all sizes and shapes from hundreds of millions of years to trends in popular culture which tend to last a period of a few months to a year or two or three. So, uh, but the important thing about this picture or this uh, graphic is the fact that no trend lasts forever. Trends always end. So if trends always end, how do they end? How do they end? And let me show you a picture here to give you a little um, just a minute. Find the arrows. Whoops. Maybe this will work better. There we go. Okay, so here's a typical, think of it as a time series chart instead of X time in this direction. And uh, some phenomena that you're measuring, population, financial uh, movements or whatever. And what you see on this chart, I've marked some parts of it in solid colors and some in dotted. The places along the timeline where you see dotted curve, these are what I would call ordinary points. They're places where whatever the current trend is, in the next time moment, that trend will continue. It'll be a little bit better if the trend is increasing, a little worse if it's decreasing. So the only points on this timeline where there's trouble are these points A, B, and C, where the current trend is changing to its opposite. These are what in the mathematical world are called critical points, critical points. And you notice, first of all, that along the timeline, if you would close your eyes and just pick out some point at random, you'd have probability one of being at an ordinary point. In other words, that if you picked out an ordinary point and say, what is the world going to be like tomorrow? The answer is, just like today, except a little better or a little worse. The only point that you could pick out which would not have that characteristic would be point A or point B, not even point C. Point C doesn't happen in the real world. It's a mathematically a degenerate critical point. So you, in the real world data, you only see points like A and B. And those points form an infinitesimally small set, subset actually, in the set of all time moments. So this now gives you some illustration of why trend following is so seductive. It's easy and it's almost always right. So if you don't happen to pick a point A or B, then everything will be just like it has been. And so you have probability one of being successful. And this is why people like to do trend following because they're almost always right. The problem with it is that all of the action where things really get interesting are at the points A and, A and B, or near the points A and B. But they're rare. They're very rare. And if the bottom of a trend, or the top, is very sharp, in other words, if the curvature is very sharp, then you're in danger when you get to the top and the trend changes, all of a sudden flipping to something dramatically different. And the more dramatically different, the more extreme the event is. And it's those extreme events that interest me. So unlike most people, I think I'm more interested in the complement of the ordinary points, not the ordinary points. The ordinary points themselves are very boring. They're ordinary. But the critical points are really exciting because that's where the information is. And in fact, you don't need to hire a futurist to tell you about the ordinary points. You can just do it yourself. Uh, so Matthias Horx doesn't have to come here and tell you about the ordinary points and what the trend will be like if things just continue. But if you had some knowledge about when you're getting near one of the points A or B, then that's knowledge that's 
has real value, real information content. And it's really because it's not so easy because they're by definition very rare. They form a set of measure zero in the set of all time points. And that's a mathematical uh, observation, or not observation, it's a theorem. So let's see how critical point. And, and I might mention that I don't think that it's possible, and you'll see why in a moment, I don't think that it's even logically possible to think about predicting, forecasting exactly where those points like A and B are. Well, I think the best you can hope for is to get some sense of anticipating when you're getting into the region, the shadow, if you like, of one of those points. But to actually predict the point itself, I think, is not possible. And so let me tell you why. So human events, extreme events or otherwise, are a combination of two things. A chance and necessity. The chance part is a random trigger that sets off a sequence that ends up in something you call a dramatic event, or just an event, plus context, the context, the context within which events unfold. Now, think about, for example, just to illustrate this point, think about the, the so-called Arab Spring 2011 and think about what happened in Tunisia, which was the first place where there was some uh, actual visible uh, dramatic events. And so what, what happened was that in the environment prior to that time in Tunisia, there was a lot of unrest, like, a little bit like the Ukraine over the past uh, few weeks. But it took some random trigger and by random, I mean it's an event that has no pattern whatsoever. This is why I don't think that you can predict in the usual sense these kind of events. It took a random trigger, which in that Tunisian case was some fruit seller setting himself a fire in a market square to sort of catalyze within the context this entire uh, sequence of activity which led to the um, what they call the Arab Spring. Um, and there are lots of other examples of that kind. So basically what I'm saying is that all events are a combination of these two things. A context which essentially determines what's possible. The space of all possible next events. And of course they're not all equally likely. And a random trigger which picks out of that context a specific event, is, which is what you actually see, what you observe, what you get. So you could think about this in the context of, say, weather forecasting. Weather forecasting fits very well into this. You have a context. You, have, you can go outside and measure wind velocities, temperature, humidity, and so on. These quantities determine the context within which tomorrow's weather is going to appear. And some things in the, uh, are, uh, possibilities are much more likely than others uh, to, uh, like, for example, the, the likelihood of a massive snowstorm in Arweiler tomorrow is not impossible, but it's not, it's not big, it's small. Uh, the likelihood is much greater that it won't be much different than today. We'll be at, we're at an ordinary point. But <coughs> uh, the random trigger could be something like that famous butterfly down in the Amazon flapping its wings and setting off a tornado in Nebraska uh, a day or two downstream. Some impossible to predict random event that happens at just the right moment in the right context to set off something dramatic. So I like to think about this in the following geometric way. Imagine this context is, is some kind of a landscape with hills and valleys and plateaus and so on. But it's a landscape that's always dynamically shifting. And suppose at a particular moment you're sitting on top of, uh, on a flat plateau tabletop in this landscape, f away from the away from the edge. 
So you're on this nice flat place. And some random event, the butterfly flaps its wings, and it moves you a little bit from where you're currently at. But nothing much happens because you're in a nice flat place. You just get pushed over a little bit. But suppose now that as time moves along, that plateau that you've been sitting on sort of morphs into a mountain top. And maybe you don't even notice it until you look around and say, gee, where is everybody? You know, I thought it was on th I'm now sitting up on this sharp peak. And down around me are all these different valleys that represent, let's say, different types of weather, snowstorm, sun, whatever. And now the, mount the butterfly flaps its wings, and it doesn't take much of a push to send you off the top of this mountain. And the specific type of random shock that you get, random trigger, in the direction that it comes from, determines what valley you fall into. And that valley itself is the weather that comes tomorrow. Uh, so some of those valleys are very big, and that weather is more likely. Some might be very sh narrow and sharp, and then that's less likely. But the fact is that landscape, that undulating, dynamically shifting landscape, the context, plus the random trigger, creates what we actually see, what we get from the space of all possibilities. And of course, I if any of you here are physicist, you'll recognize this story because this is actually very much the story from quantum mechanics. That you have the context in quantum theory is measured by something called the Schrodinger wave function. And that wave function specifies all of the different possible events that could happen. And the random trigger is, it depends on which uh, uh, um, view of quantum theory you take, but the conventional view is called the Copenhagen interpretation, is that the observer, when you actually observe the system, you have injected, you are the random trigger. The moment and the way that you observe the system causes that wave function of all possibilities to collapse into a single point, and that single point is what you see when you make the observation. It's the event that you actually get. It's like this famous uh, cat experiment, the cat in the box. The quantum theory says the cat is neither alive nor dead. And you, you put some poison gas or something in, but you don't observe the cat, so it's only partly alive and partly dead, according to the quantum theorists, until you open the box and look in. And as soon as you look, the part alive, part dead collapses to a single point. Either The point is either alive or dead. So this is the same picture. Uh, except scaled up, if you like, to the human domain. I, I forgot to mention the kinds of extreme events that I'm most concerned with are not the kind that you get from nature. I'm not concerned very much with earthquakes, hurricanes, windstorms, asteroid impacts, and so on. Uh, not that I don't think they're important and interesting, or even f that they don't fall into this framework. It's just that a lot of smart people have spent a lot of decades studying these phenomena, and and have still not come up with any really knockdown uh, good theories for how you'd anticipate an earthquake or an asteroid impact. Uh, I'm a lot more interested in the kind of events that come about because of human activity, not nature. Human activity. And especially the extreme events that come because of human error, uh, miscalculation, uh, malevolent intent, or just plain stupidity. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of that that's going around. So uh, the point is that there are lots of extreme events that happen in human life uh, that we don't really have a very good handle on. We don't have a very good idea of how to anticipate them, and I think that we should spend a lot more time studying these things. In fact, that's why I wrote that book that was passed around here a minute ago, the one with the black cover that is about, it's 
U.S. title is X events. The German publisher liked something a little bit more Germanic, so uh, you get a uh, different uh, title, uh, the end of everything. But it's not the end of everything. It's the beginning of something, not the end of everything. Okay, so now let's talk about the landscape of events. We cannot predict a random phenomena, the trigger. So let's focus attention on the, the context. And I think that the primary drivers of the context for human events are two factors. One I call complexity gap. And, and I'm going to tell you more about both of these in a minute. And the second one is mass psychology human psychology, the beliefs that a population holds as a group about its future. If people feel tomorrow will be better than today, then they're in, let's say, in a positive mood, positive social mood, they're optimistic, they're looking forward to the future. That's an entirely different framework than if people are pessimistic about the future, if they fear the future. The kinds of events that you can expect to see in those two different regimes are very, very different. And I'm going to show you some examples here in a minute. So what you need in order to get some handle on the context and how it's changing is some way of characterizing the what I call the complexity gaps. These are the gaps that exist between two different systems in interaction. Say you take the financial system and the government regulators. Those are two different systems in interaction. Each system has its own level of complexity. And there's a gap. The level of complexity will not be the same. Those complexity levels are dynamically shifting. And at some times, the, le the gap is big. At other times, it's not so big. And the size of that gap is a measure of how much stress there is in that system of the regulators and the financial markets. And it's a little bit like stretching a rubber band. If that gap gets too big, then you get into critical stress. And either you have to voluntarily reduce that stress, or nature, in this case human nature, will step in and do it for you. And if human nature has to do it, then it won't be too pretty. It'll be like stretching the rubber band, it just breaks. Uh, so part of the story here is to ask how do we characterize the complexity and how do we measure complexity gaps. And that book that was passed around here a moment ago, X Events, the reason I said a moment ago that it's not about the end of the world, as the German publisher Pieper Verlag would like you to believe, uh, that book is not the story of that at all. It, the, what it, the book is really about is the question, it's in trying to answer the question, how do you characterize risk and measure risk in a situation where you have no data, exactly zero data? Now, all of conventional risk analysis is based on the idea that you have a database of happenings from the past, and if you want to know how risky is it that an earthquake or a financial crash or whatever is going to happen in the future, you go to this database and you use it to calculate some empirical probability distribution. And you use that distribution and some statistical wizardry and so on to give some measure of how risky it is. Well, and I, and I don't have anything against that. I think it's basically a pretty good procedure, except it relies upon having something that you don't have, namely data. What if you're talking about some event that's never happened before? There's no data for that, but there's still plenty of risk. So how do you characterize? How do you characterize that risk and how do you measure it? Well, that book uh, is a kind of 300-page partial answer to that question, and it involves this first element on this list, complexity. The second element on the list, psychology. I said a moment ago, it's about how a population believes about its future. Because, in fact, human events, both at the individual level and at the collective level, are almost always governed 
not by what actually is the case, but they're governed by what people believe is the case. And this is why I always get a little impatient, and I had a lot of experience with this, getting impatient when I was at the Santa Fe Institute, because this was a place populated by physicists. And physicists, by their very training, are conditioned to look for what actually is the case. And they go to laboratories, make observations, and so on. And so when they start moving into the social realm and say things like, well, as soon as we finish polishing up our theory of everything, we'll come over and help straighten your field out too. Uh, which uh, I'm sorry to say is a not uncommon attitude. They, they start going in and looking about what is the case and start trying to forecast what's going on with human affairs by looking at actual what they think of as facts. And they are facts, except very often they're kind of irrelevant to what actually happens because what actually happens is determined by what people believe. Believe are the facts, not what the actual facts are. And so this is a, a bit of a cognitive dissonance sets in because you can't use the tools from physics which have, by their very design, they have nothing to say about psychology. Planets don't have beliefs. Billiard balls don't have beliefs. Electrons don't have beliefs. To use the very same tools to talk about what human beings or other cognitive agents might do in given situations. You need to have talk, talking about the real situation, which has to do with how people feel and believe, not, not uh, what you think they believe, or even uh, nothing about beliefs. So anyway, collective beliefs are important. And um, I wrote a book about this a few years ago in 2010 called Mood Matters, which is really a, an account of this second element on this, uh, on this slide. Um, I'm sorry to have to tell you that the, no German publisher, actually it was a German publisher that published that book. It was published by a, a company called Copernicus, which is an arm of Springer Verlag, uh, except it was published in English in New York, not in Heidelberg. But uh, there, there's not yet a German translation, but maybe later. Okay, so let me tell you now, just give you a little bit of information about these two components that go into shaping what I think of as the context of events. First of all, talk about complexity. Now, I first started getting the idea that's in that book, X Events, when I read this 1988 book by Joseph Tainter. Tainter is an American uh, archaeologist, and he wrote <coughs> this very fascinating book, 26 years ago, actually, uh, called The Collapse of Complex Societies. And the, the point of, I, I'm a little sorry that I didn't read the book 26 years ago. I uh, could have started this line of thinking a lot sooner. But uh, never mind. What Tainter is trying to address in this book is the following question. He says, look, Throughout history, we have plenty of examples of civilizations and societies that came and went, societies that vanished. The Romans are just one in a very long list, and our own society will be added to that list at some time, uh, un unknown, but certainly will be in the next uh, few hundred years at, at most. And Tainter wanted to address the question, is there some common cause? Why do civilizations disappear? Is there something, it was, is, does each case have to be looked at separately as a, as a special case? Or is there some kind of common structure that leads to the collapse of these different civilizations? And his story is that there is such a common structure. And to dramatically oversimplify his argument, the common structure it relates to complexity. Tainter argues that every society, every civilization, faces problems. Problems just come. It could be weather, it could be invading uh, neighbors, it could be disease or whatever. They face problems. And the common 
reaction for how the society deals with problems is to say we have to create a new level of structure in our society whose job is to solve that problem. Okay. And a recent example is after the attack that brought down the World Trade Centers in 2001, the US government faced a problem. And that problem was terrorism on US soil. And because this was the first time that the US had ever been attacked by foreign elements on US territory. And so the reaction from the US government was exactly what you would expect if you had read Tainter. The government introduced a new structure whose job was to address this problem. And that structure has a name. It's called the Department of Homeland Security. And the one thing that's interesting about these structures is that almost without fail, the structures far outlive the problem they were created to solve. Long after the last terrorist has gone to terrorist heaven, I can assure you the Department of Homeland Security will still be there doing something but they certainly won't be addressing the problem of terrorism. So what happens then when the next problem comes? Well, another structure is introduced. And the problem after that, and the problem after that. Layer after layer after layer of structure. Until, at some point, the society reaches the stage where all of the resources of the society are being consumed maintaining this structure. There's no resource left for the next problem. So what happens? What, what happens when the next problem comes? Well, I think that you know what happens. Nothing happens because uh, there's no resources left. Or even worse, the problem gets given over to one of the existing structures that is wildly unsuited for dealing with that problem. And so the problem uh, uh, essentially doesn't get addressed. And the problem after that, until at some point, the whole structure goes off the edge. So that's Tainter's argument. Complexity overload. And he gives lots of examples of it in this book, which I commend to all of your attention. Or you can go to the internet, and look him up, and see some of the articles that he's done. The point is, societies become too complex. In, in this case, complexity is measured just by the number of layers of structure in the system. A very simple but effective way of measuring complexity. Now, in my book, X Event, I only slightly expanded upon this idea by what I told you a moment ago. Ask, because Tainter just talks about a single system, the whole society or the whole civilization. But I talked about the question when you have more than one system in interaction, each of which has its own layer, level of complexity, and when those levels are changing so that one of them becomes too big relative to the other. What you want for harmonious balance is they don't have to have exactly the same level, but they need to be within some comfort zone of each other. And if that comfort zone gets stretched, then you start having trouble. Okay, so anyway, this was Tainter's idea. And here are some examples of complexity mismatches, some of which are discussed in that book, some not. There, there are lots of other examples. The two Koreas, North and South. Jap the Japanese earthquake, 2011, the Fukushima incident, it's an interesting one. Because on the surface, you might say, oh, this was a problem brought on by nature. It wasn't a human complexity mismatch problem. And, and I... <coughs> question that interpretation because I think it was a human problem uh, for a couple of reasons. Yes, on uh, what philosophers might call the proximate cause, the surface cause, if you like, of the uh, Fukushima meltdown was this earthquake but and the tsunami that the earthquake generated. But in fact, it, I think it was a human problem more because, first of all, the Japanese planners never had in mind the idea that you might have an earthquake. It didn't even occur to them you might have an earthquake that would be bigger than any earthquake that ever happened before. 
So the planning they made for the retaining walls to keep back the tsunami was only at a level of the greatest, or the largest earthquake that had ever happened before, and the one that happened was greater than magnitude nine, bigger than any earthquake that ever happened before. So the retaining walls were too low, and further, the problem further compounded by the pumps that were put in to pump out any water that happened to get across the retaining walls were down low behind the retaining walls. So as soon as the water came in, the pumps all got flooded and they couldn't function. So they, they weren't put up at a higher level where they could be uh, still functional. So here you have a complexity mismatch essentially between the human planners, the Japanese planners for that site, and the nature. Uh, and the gap became too big and you get a crash. So anyway, there, here are a few others and there are many others that you can see in that book X event. The point is that when you start thinking in these terms, you see these mismatches everywhere. Uh, and uh, and the, the thing that's most amazing is we don't have more crashes. Uh, not that we have any crashes, we, that we don't have more. Okay, now let me shift gears and talk about psychology and what I called earlier social mood. And <clears throat> if you want to use that idea in any meaningful sense, you have to have some way to measure the social mood. How would you measure the beliefs in a population about its future? Optimistic or pessimistic? Well, it turns out that a pretty good measure, it's, it's by no means perfect, but one that's easy to get and pretty effective, is just look at what the financial markets are doing as a sociometer, if you like, a thermometer of social belief. And why would I suggest the financial markets? Well, if you have to think for a moment about what actually happens in a stock market, for instance, what does a stock market really do? Well, sort of slim down to its bare essentials, what it is is a place where people make bets. And they make bets about the future. So if you're optimistic about the future, if you believe a particular uh, stock is going to, then, then the prices go up, then you buy because you think tomorrow will be better and prices will be higher. And if you're pessimistic about the future, if you think that tomorrow will be worse than today, then you sell. And this happens on all time scales, whether you're a day trader, a long-term investor, or something in between. And so um, the financial markets gather all these orders for buying and selling together and synthesize them into a single number, a change of price, up or down. And if the price is moving up, then the dominant mood is positive and people are optimistic about the future. And if it's moving down, just the opposite. Now, I know that in the discussion session, you're all going to ask me the following question, because people always do. So I'm going to make a preemptive strike and answer this question now before you ask it. And the question is, and it's a good question, and it's not a stupid question by any means. It's a real good question. And that is, I'm saying you use the financial market index as a measure of social mood mood of an entire population. You could say, well, how could it possibly be that the actions of a handful of traders in Frankfurt or New York or Tokyo can reflect the mood of the entire population in Germany, USA, or Japan? How can that be? Because the number of traders who are engaged in actually buying and selling is a, a nano scopic fraction of the entire population. How can their actions talk about how you believe, or you believe, or me? Well, the, tr the longer answer to this question you'll find in my book, Mood Matters. But the short answer is to keep in mind that these traders are part of the population themselves. They're, they're not sort of disconnected from the population. And the traders, they read newspapers, they watch TV, they have friends that they go down to the corner bar and have a drink with, and so on. So they get lots of input 
in their life from other people in their social circles. And their acts, their beliefs, if you like, are impacted by this information, just like all of us. The only way that we, our beliefs are created are as a consequence of the information that comes to us from various sources. And so these traders are influenced in their own beliefs about the future by what they see, what they read, what people tell them, and so on. And as a consequence, they serve as a kind of surrogates for big groups of the population. And so it's a reasonable conjecture that the financial market indices might be helpful in characterizing the social mood. But in the final analysis, it, you have to take it to the laboratory and t check it out see it might just be a hypothesis that doesn't work out. So let me show you a couple of examples now of using this. Now I should tell you beforehand <coughs> one of the uh, weak points of using the financial markets is that it's a kind of highly aggregated measure. It's a measure of the entire population and their beliefs about the future. Now, you might be in a situation where you want to know about the beliefs of a subpopulation. You might want to know about how do all the immigrants in Germany feel about the future, or how do all of the people who live in um, Hamburg feel about the future. Well, the stock market average is not going to help you there because it's a, an indicator for the entire country. So, if, if, so there are other kinds of sociometers, and some of them are described in my book, but the stock market average is one that's easy to use. One of the reasons I like it, of course, is, first of all, there's lots of data. It's good, clean data. There's not a lot of measurement error in it. It exists on all time scales, from second to second trading to year to year to decade to decade, whatever trading. Uh, what, whatever future you're interested in, there's stock market data available. To tell, and there's a lot of data. It's been going on for a long time. R right now, people are using, as this graphic shows you, social media data for characterizing how people feel about the future. And I'm actually pretty enthusiastic about this because here you get down to actual the, the actual atoms of the society. It's not you're not just looking at high level aggregates or surrogates like stock traders. You're looking at what people are actually saying. And this uh, these Twitter feeds and uh, media from Facebook and other places, this is big Big data is what it's called nowadays, and people are doing lots of mining of this big data to get exactly the same kind of information that I'm interested in, how people are feeling about the future. The, the only drawback to this at the moment, compared to this financial data, is that uh, there's not much data around. There's, there's a lot of data in the short immediate term, but there's not much historical data. These services haven't been around long enough. Uh, you, you can get stock market data if you want to go back 100 years. Uh, you, there's no Twitter data that you can go to uh, what people were saying 100 years ago. The data is just not there yet, and it won't be there for a long time. So anyway, let me show you a couple of examples of this financial data. So here's something that I kind of like. It's, it's kind of fun. Uh, I call it the skyscraper index. <coughs> and what you see on this picture are the last three incarnations of the world's tallest buildings. Now often when countries, especially little countries, are having some success financially or otherwise and want to draw attention to themselves, a little bit like sh short people actually, they, they undertake the task of building the world's tallest building because they know that that's going to get a lot of media attention and that there are people who are going to be uh, wondering, well, n they're now going to know where we are on the map because we have the world's tallest building. Okay. And so that's what happened in Malaysia uh, some years ago when they built the Petronas Towers, which is the picture at the top. And then later, Taiwan came online with Taipei 101, which then became the world's tallest building. 
and more recently down here you have Dubai which has currently the world's tallest building um, originally it was called Burj Dubai now it's called Burj Khalifa in honor of the leader of Abu Dhabi who had to jump in with several billion dollars to help them out to finish the construction uh, so he it got named in his honor just like people who give money to universities and so on they get a building in their honor <coughs> well that Mr. Khalifa got this building and what I've drawn here for you are, in the red lines, are the <coughs> stock market index in those regions. So at the top you have the index, the Kuala Lumpur stock index. In the middle is the uh, Taiwan Taiex index, and the bottom the, Burj, uh, the Dubai financial index. And what's interesting about these indices is those two blue arrows on each index. The first blue arrow, the one on the left, is the moment when construction actually began on this building, when the first shovel full of dirt came out of the ground. And the second arrow is when the building was completed, when it topped out. And what you see here is that in each case, uh, the optimism was quite high at the time of construction. People were optimistic in Malaysia, Taiwan, uh, Dubai, and said, let's build the world's tallest building. And after the construction started, they were still optimistic. Financial markets were still moving upward. But in fact, uh, these skyscrapers don't come out of the ground overnight. It takes several years to build one of these things. And the second arrow shows you where things were when the building was finished. And you see, without exception, uh, I didn't finish this one yet. This slide needs to be updated. But if it were updated, that second arrow would be somewhere down here. Uh, the financial markets were in the tank by the time the building was finished. So what is the story that, or what's the, um, message, take-home message from this idea. Yeah, the take-home message is simple. The next time you see some country, especially if it's a small country, saying we're going to build the world's tallest building, yes, keep an eye on them. And if they actually, and, and I'll tell you already, I'll tell you right now what the country that is, Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia has not only announced the world's tallest building, the Kingdom Tower is what it's to be called, it will be in Jeddah. They've already started construction, so the clock is running on Saudi Arabia now. And, and I can hardly wait to update this picture. Uh, but one of the things that you should do, not immediately, but as you can see, maybe a year or so afterwards, this is a good time to start selling short the stocks in that index. And you have an excellent chance that by the time the building is finished, this is kind of a long-term play. You have to sell short and hold on for, to that position for a few years until the building is finished. But the chances are pretty good by the time the building is finished, you'll be sitting on a nice profit and maybe enough to even make a little holiday to go to the place to visit your building and uh, thank it for uh, improving your future. So the point is that social mood in these countries waxes and wanes, and when it's waxing, when it's going up, this is when countries do things very different than when it's going down. There's no way that in Taiwan, Kuala Lumpur, or whatever, that they would have started this building with the beliefs of the population about its future being down here. You have to be optimistic about the future to build one of these buildings. You have to believe that somebody's going to come and rent offices and buy apartments and so on in this building. And right now, uh, this building, Burj Khalifa, it's half empty. It's half empty. Uh, and, and it will never pay off that building. So it, it's only for uh, ego gratification of the government. It's certainly not for any useful practical purpose. Okay, so much for the skyscraper index. Let me talk about something a little more serious. Here's Middle East. Uh, here you see a uh, little history of the Middle East 
for the last 20, uh, sorry, 35 years, to up to 2010 when I made or <coughs> got this picture. Uh, and at the top, these are the three major players in the Middle East, the USA, the Arabs, and the Israelis. And at the top, you see in green the social mood for the USA, as characterized by the Standard & Poor's 500 index of the US market. In the middle, you see the Israeli <coughs> Tel Aviv 100 index in blue. And in the bottom, as measure for the Arabian states, um, the index in Jordan, in Amman. And <coughs> what I've marked in here, this slide, I apologize, it's a little bit busy, it has a lot of stuff on it, but major kind of events that took place in the Middle East, Oslo Accords, Syria ends occupation of Lebanon, Hamas seizes Gaza, and so on. And in general, if you go through this picture, and you can do it later at your leisure, you see that, roughly speaking, when people are optimistic about the future in the Middle East. Nice thing, nicer things tend to happen than when people are pessimistic. When people are fearing the future in general, then you get things like the Lebanon War, or you get Israel completes withdrawal from Lebanon at the end of a long period, and then things start moving downward. And you get, tend to get wars in times when uh, people are fearful about the future in the Middle East. So this is one way of characterizing some earliest understanding better some of the events of Middle East over the last uh, few decades. So. Um, let me now move on to the X events. I told you about um, now the issues of mood and complexity gaps. And the X events are really the places where trends roll over to the opposite, and especially when they roll over rapidly. And here are some examples of a few recent, relatively recent, not, not all, but recent accidents. Hurricane Sandy in New York, the f sad fate of the Nokia Corporation from Finland, Second World War, <coughs> financial crisis in 2007, the Lehman bankruptcy, and so on. And we can ask this question about, you know, on the one hand, most people, when they would see a list like this, they would say, gee, you know, what a, what a pity that we couldn't do something to prevent these events, to prevent them. That this was, these were pretty nasty. And, and I, I can tell you from my vantage point now in New York, where my university is located, is right in Hoboken, New Jersey. It's directly across the Hudson River from Manhattan. And this place suffered a lot of damage from Hurricane Sandy. I wasn't there at the time, but I have a lot of stories from people that I know, my colleagues and so on, who lived through that hurricane. And they would certainly all say, I don't want to have to live through another one. It was a very unpleasant experience. In Second World War, many millions of people would say make the same statement. They would not like to live through another one. And so on. So the general view is, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could prevent these kind of things from happening? Well, since I'm a contrarian at heart, and I wasn't there during Hurricane Sandy, I, wouldn't, I would say it wouldn't be so nice. It's unpleasant for people who suffer through these events. Nobody can uh, argue with that, and n not even I would argue with that. But I would also make the argument, which is a little bit in a contrarian direction, to say, without these kind of events, there would never be any human progress. There would be no human progress. So if trend followers were really right, there would be no progress in life the trends would eventually just level out and stay there indefinitely. So if you want to, it, it, it's a little bit like the old saying, you know, if you want to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. And it's the same story for human activity. You have to have these events because what, what do they actually do? They have the effect of clearing out 
lots of social structures, inf uh, dead wood and other things that have long outlived their usefulness, and opening up space for new products, new services, new ways of life. And in fact, if it had not been for that asteroid at the Yucatan Peninsula that blew away the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, we would not be st sitting in this room today. I wouldn't be here giving this talk and you wouldn't be here listening to it because that asteroid cleared away all sorts of ecospace, new niches open that organisms that survived the asteroid impact, including our very ancient ancestors, jumped in to fill those niches and evolved to where we are here today, among other various organisms. So the fact is that these uh, extreme events, the destructive ones, should be looked at as both a problem as well as an opportunity. And so our real challenge, in my view, is not to eliminate X events, because they cannot be eliminated. They happen whether you want them or not. But to, to, first of all, to understand them, and secondly, to um, develop some understanding for how to survive them because it's the survivors. If the X event blows you away, like the dinosaur, then you're not going to be a beneficiary of it. You're going to be a victim. But if, on the other hand, the X event opens up space, that you look around and you say, gee, I have some resources here. I can actually fill that niche that's been opened up. And this is what happened with Nokia. Nokia is a kind of uh, double case. Uh, Nokia was chugging along very nicely in Finland as a manufacturer of bicycle tires and rubber boots for rainy days in Finland, of which there are many. And they, but the management there saw when the European uh, uh, community adopted the GSM cell phone standard, they said, wait a minute, we have the resources in our company, because they had a small electronics division as well, we have the resources in our company, we can build handsets using this standard. And they jumped in immediately, and of course uh, uh, they ended up, or not ended up, at one point they were the world's biggest manufacturer of cell phones and, and some, uh, represented 10% of the, the Finnish economy. One company was 10% of the whole economy. Now they fell on hard times, and they fell on hard times because the management became all of a sudden a lot less uh, risk-taking. This is often what happens when you have success in life. All of a sudden you have something to lose, so you don't take chances anymore. But nevertheless, they saw the opportunity created by an X event, which happened in that case to have been the adoption of the cell phone standard, and jumped in with both hands and feet and took advantage of it. So it's an opportunity as well as a problem. And so this, this ties in with the currently fashionable idea, which is, goes under the label of resilience. This is a kind of buzzword, a little bit like uh, complexity was 20 years ago when I first went to the Santa Fe Institute. Everybody was talking about complexity and uh, deconstructionist philosophers and li uh, literary folks were, were jumping on. They say, oh, I, we know what complexity is. And everybody had their own idea. And in fact, because it, it was an everyday word that everybody had a picture in their mind of what it meant. And that was great, except if you could open up those brains and look in, you'd see a different picture in every brain. And that was not so great. Uh, so, and now, uh, fortunately, complexity is sort of, there's a kind of convergence and people have a better fa understanding of the fact that it's a kind of multi-dimensional concept. Resilience is now moved on to center stage. And again, everybody has some idea in their mind of what it means to be resilient. Uh, and some 
imagine that it's the same thing as stability, namely uh, you're resilient if, you're, if you get a shock and eventually you survive the shock and go back to what you were doing before as if the shock had never happened. Uh, that's a, a very weak and feeble notion of resilience. In fact, you don't need a new word for that. It's, it's stability. We have a word already. But nevertheless, there are other possibilities a little more proactive. And so I think that it has a lot to do with not only can you survive a shock, but can you take advantage of the new space that's opened up as a result of that shock, like our ancient ancestors or Nokia Corporation. Uh, you have to be adaptive and uh, recognize that you can't continue to think about doing business as before because there is no before. Na there's only now and the future. Before is gone. And so here uh, is a part of my argument for why I think X events are necessary for human progress because that progress really involves innovation and filling new niches. But if the new niches are not there, there's nothing to fill. And those niches only get created by usually extreme uh, disturbances, crashes, if you like. And for the reason is very simple in the social domain, that the usual power structures in society, the politicians and the financial people together, the one thing in the world that they do not want is major change. They like things just the way they are because they're the biggest beneficiaries of it. And so they resist with all the forces at their disposal, which are considerable, any kind of major change. Uh, you know, they say, oh, we'll fix a few things, polish things around the edges and so on. But they're not willing to bite the bullet and say, we have to completely throw this structure away and build a new one. That almost never happens. But nature doesn't care, and human nature doesn't care either. And if those stresses build to too great a level, as we're seeing in many parts of the world now, uh, eventually the power structures get thrown out. This is what revolutions are about. So, so ch major change only happens in a kind of revolutionary way, not in an evolutionary way. And so uh, sometimes when I say this, people ask me, they say, gee, do you mean we should go out and deliberately create hurricanes and make earthquakes and uh, topple, turn society upside down and so on? And my answer is, well, not quite. I don't quite mean that. What I really mean is that we should try and be a little bit more imaginative and work a little harder at trying to figure out how we can create what I call here controlled X events. The kind of, do the kind of experiments, if you like, that don't kill the experimenter, but still serve to clear away some structures in society that have long outlived their usefulness, like the Department of Homeland Security, for example. How do you get rid of them? Now, interestingly enough, uh, we actually already do this in a lot of different ways in everyday life. Uh, we do things like burn down parts of forests so that the rest of the forest has a better chance for surviving. That's a controlled X event. If the burning process gets out of control and starts burning up the, 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 the foresters, then you have a problem. But we know how to do that. You do the same thing when you raise animals or do agriculture. You, you pull out weeds from your garden so that the flowers and the vegetable plants have a better chance to survive. Uh, you do the same thing when you breed animals. So it's not like controlled X events are unknown. But people sort of start drawing the line when they say, well, gee, yeah, well, that's okay for animals and uh, <coughs> trees, but what about humans? How would we do it in a human environment? And I'll just give you one example that I happen to know well, and, and then we'll, we'll close this talk. Um, this is about health care which is a major contentious item in a lot of parts of the world. And it's about health insurance. Uh, and it, it's, it took place in the American state where I come from originally, the state of Oregon, which is on the west coast between California and Washington. 
people in that state were always rather progressive politically and otherwise and a few years ago they basically said, look, we can't wait for the federal government to finally wake up. We need to provide health care for citizens of this state. And so they took it upon themselves to create a health care program. But they realized, realistically in my opinion, that with limited resources, you cannot buy insurance against everything. There will always be things that can happen that you can't get insurance for. And if you don't believe that, just go to some insurance company and try and buy insurance against some uh, uh, outrageous or rare event. Uh, they'll just send you away. And one of the reasons they'll send you away because they don't have much data about those kind of events. So what did the state of Oregon do? They said, okay, this is the amount of resource that we have available for this program. And they basically made a huge list of all the kinds of services, illnesses, and so on that people might need for health care. And they made an estimate of how much each of these things would cost. And they just went down the list until they came to a point where all the money had been spent. And they drew a line and they said, well, if your problem is below this line, we can't help you. We can't help you. You're outside the system. Now, a lot of people would say, gosh, this must have been political suicide to set up a system like this. Who, who, the peop, especially the people who are below the line, or even the ones above the line who said everybody uh, should be covered, would vote you out of office uh, faster than uh, uh, <coughs> the president of the Ukraine got kicked out of the office. But in fact, that nothing like that happened. This is the interesting part. Nothing even remotely close to that happened. And you can ask, well, why not? Why didn't it happen? Well, the, the reason it didn't happen, in my opinion, is number one, the entire process was totally transparent. Everybody knew what was going on all the time. And every citizen of the state had their opportunity to make their comments and register their feelings about this system. So even those who were below the line had the opportunity, they didn't feel like they were discriminated against. They, they, they realized finite resources means only a finite amount of coverage, and we had the opportunity to make our voice heard. So essentially it boiled down to the fact that the citizens had a certain measure of trust in the government. And, and this is something I, I would say is, is hugely lacking in societies around the world today, is trust, not just in government, but trust in institutions in general. Companies, trust in your neighbors, trust in your government. That this is, the, if I would say I had resources to invest in trying to address one single problem in modern life, this is where I would invest them into trying to figure out how are you going to build trust. Uh, but that's a side issue. Okay, so the idea here is how do you create controlled X events. So here's the take home message. And I told you about a couple of books. There they are, X events and so mood matters. When I wrote those books, one is about psychology, the other one's about complexity. I thought they were interesting topics at the time, worth spending some time writing a book about. But after I finished them, I, I had the nagging feeling that somehow they were only pieces of a bigger picture. They were important pieces of a bigger picture, but I didn't really have a vision of the bigger picture until about a year ago when I finally put together this diagram. And, and I feel comfortable with this picture. And you see that those previous stories about psychology and complexity, they sort of enter in at the beginning in the, let's see here, in creating a change of context. I told you the context is driven by the complexity gaps and beliefs in the future, social mood. And that's what changes the context uh, in a dynamic way. 
And then you have a random shock, this trigger, that sets off an actual event. The context, remember, only specifies the space of what's possible, but it doesn't tell you what you're going to get. The random trigger is what determines what you actually get. And then you get this X event, which is usually destructive, a crash of one type or another, which clears up a lot of uh, social debris the, and structures that didn't need to be there. And that gives the opportunity then for a rebirth, a reconfiguration of the social order. And what happens then after that process, that innovation process, runs its course, then, you, then new trends start and you go back to the beginning of this picture. Now this picture is a little bit misleading in that respect because it makes it look like it's circular. I don't think it's circular, I think it's a helix. Uh, I should draw it in a third dimension. And if you go back in, a, let's say, an upward fashion, then you think of progress. They've had progress. If, but, uh, but there's no guarantee that you're going to get progress. It may, you may get regress. And you go back and it's things in some sense are worse than they were uh, before you started. Uh, that could happen. So th this picture, in my opinion, needs to be projected out into a third dimension. And maybe one of these days I'll do that. So in any case, and so some of the take-home messages are complexity kills. An overdose of complexity, tainter style, uh, will surely send your society off the edge at some point. Human events cannot be forecast. The social mood, the beliefs of a population, have a strong biasing factor in what events actually occur. If you're optimistic about the future, you tend to get events that you might label with everyday words like global, joining, welcoming, happy, and so on. And if you're pessimistic about the future, if you fear the future rather than welcome it, you'd get just the opposite. Instead of global, you get localization. Instead of welcoming, you get rejecting. Instead of <coughs> adjoining, you get separating, and so on. So the qualitative character of the types of events that you can expect to see is dramatically shifted or biased, if you like, by the beliefs of the population. And finally, the last one uh, is that X events are necessary for rebirth. You don't get something for nothing, uh, is the message. And so the question really is, uh, how do you get the best you can with the resources you have available? But you're not going to get something for nothing. Okay, so the final picture. Now, now, it's, now that you've been very patient and listened to this talk, now you have to have the advertisement. And here it is. <laughs> uh, so here are these.